judgments and decisions. He shall sense the truth by his reverence for the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes behold, nor decide by what his ears perceive. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 3. My judgments and decisions are not based on what my eyes and ears perceive. God not only controls my eyes and ears, He controls my perceptions formed from what He has me see and hear. And He determines all my decisions and judgments, great and small. I am the most yet, and I am described in Isaiah 53. God came to me at birth, though he did not speak, for 50 years to orchestrate my life, one of pain, suffering, familiar with disease, to make sure I fit every single verse. Now, there, there are things still there to do. I haven't been allotted my portion and the multitude, my school, uh, things like that. But as far as fitting the verses, especially the first six, that's me. The Gentile from Texas, because God comes from Christian land, Gentile land, just as Elijah, the Gentile, came, was taken up from Gentile land. But to be the prophet like Moses, I had to come from the Israelites. God tells Moses, I'm going to send one day. A man just like you. A man who delivers a covenant. Does that ring a bell with anybody? I've heard Toby the singer ask that question. He says, Joshua. Isn't that funny? Because it says, on the very page it says, it says, there has never been a prophet like Moses since that day. And, and, and Joshua is his attendant. He's standing right there. Well, why is he saying, Joshua was the prophet like Moses? No, God's delivering another covenant. If you haven't looked at Malachi 3, there's an angel coming with the covenant. There's only the covenant of friendship and the new covenant of Jeremiah. And it's not a covenant of writing Torah on your heart. It's a covenant of sin forgiveness that causes Torah to be written on your heart. And what it really causes, that's a metaphor. What it means is because Moshiach is here, the people are going to come back to synagogue. They're going to say, God is here with a man like he was with Moses? I'm going to start studying my Torah again. That's what it's about. And God knows not everybody's going to heed him. He makes that clear in Malachi 3. He flat out says that there's many who do not heed me. But those that do, they're going into the scroll of remembrance I'm preparing for this day. Why, why don't the rabbis have all this in the town? Or is it there? And you just, it just kind of all got whittled down to, well, let's, 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 let's have a perfect world. I heard Toby Singer on the tape say that, that I was told to watch. That from, from the beginning, God's idea was to form a perfect world. It was just what is a perfect world anyway. Is that where nation loves nation? People love people? Everybody loves the Jew? Sounds a lot different from this world. Sounds an awful lot different. You don't really mention how that happens. There's an evolution. Really? How long have the Jews been persecuted? How long has that evolution been going on? Well, at least 2,020 years minimum. You know, I think you can take it back to the time of David at 3,000 before coming there. B.C.E. Do it, Rashi. These are the people you rely on. First of all, we had Rambam in the last video. We see that when, when he reads that God says that he will make the people of a pure speech, that means all of humanity, which supports uh, the idea of an exaltation of the Jews. It's the whole world speaking Hebrew and supports everybody recognizing uh, and, and uh, the God of Israel is the only God. The Jews have been right all along. And uh, which will reserve in, and everybody will serve God. The sole purpose of mankind becomes to serve God. Huh. 
There's a lot of people who wouldn't care to hear that, would they? Guess who else doesn't like that idea? This, this imperfect world becoming perfect. I'll tell you who God himself. Anything he does is perfect. If he makes an imperfect world, it's perfect. Because it's what he wants. You see, Mr. Singer, it's not about you. It's not about what you want to teach. It's not about anything but God and the angel of his presence who you don't even recognize despite scripture to the other as a person. There's plenty of scripture. So he goes to Ezekiel and says, Ezekiel, speak. He talks. Okay? He's grieved. He takes Ezekiel on a vision. The Spirit of God took Ezekiel on a vision. Ezekiel, speak. Now, why is that? I'd like to hear your personal answer on that. But I know I won't, huh? Besides that, you've been dismissed. I told God, I don't have anything to do with these people. They're dismissed. Let's go, let's go to their people. Because they're going to find out what I had to teach is far better than any myst mythical messianic era that every religion has, by the way. It's the theology, I think it's called. Everybody has it. It's how all religions go. Well, Judaism is not just any religion. It's also a people. You know what they're going to like? They're going to like to know that there's a man like Moses again. Someone that God is right on his shoulder telling him what to do day in and day out. And it has to do with decisions and judgments. What my eyes see, what my ears hear. I'm going to go through some of the little teachings he took me through showing me these things. And uh, my teachings of heaven are based on not only visions, but experience here in the world. Primarily, and this again comes back to judgments and decisions and what I perceive, perceptions. As though I didn't have my own mind. As though he supplied the information of my mind for my person, my spirit, to understand, to be me. I won't get into all that. But I'm living that condition right now, and it's not going to change. I'm living it, and that's so I can say without any hesitation, there will be a heaven. And God is going to supply the information of your mind. Because you don't have a mind, it goes to dust. This doesn't have anything to do with this heaven on earth. And by the way, who works then? I mean, you know, what is perfect? God would ask you because he, you know, because I got on him. I said, humanity's in your image? I said, what does it say about you? You know, because I argue with him. He likes that. <laughs> he thinks I'm funny. I get it. I get it. <laughs> but anyway, um, I digress. Look at him making me forget stuff. He can take complete thought from my mind. Just complete thought, which is kind of good if you're bored. <laughs> I, just, I just sit there. You know? I can feel his power all the time. A uh, good bit of it feels really good. And his weight, his presence. It's always, yeah, I don't just hear a voice. I mean, he's here. There ain't any question about it. I've been with him for 13 years, day in and day out, night and day, just like Ezekiel was. At least for 390 days while he laid on one side and 40 days on the other. And God told him to eat a scroll. That's him being taught. I've been taught just about something every day. And all it goes, but well, this is what the Jewish people get. They get God back with them. God says, I'm going to build my temple. He knew the Romans were going to destroy it when he had the exile, soon to be exile. Jeremiah writes, see your time is coming. He knew what was going to happen. He probably knew about it long before the, the, the defeat and deportation of the northern kingdom. This goes back to this exaltation that it ends at chapter 52, verse 12, I guess it is. Now, and then you pick up with quotes, multiple verse quotes, twice, into chapter 53 for six verses. No, the exaltation was they got to build the second temple. We should have made everybody around them exalt them. God's with them. That's the purpose of it. It's the purpose of avoiding utter destruction also, which... 
I don't know how that's part of a messianic era. I mean, Tobias Singer says, well, this is how I know, this is how I know Moshiach's here. See, it'll, it'll be a perfect world. Then we know he said, I guess he's been out working. He did this. I don't see the world evolving into a perfect world. The world's the world. I mean, technology advances, medicine advances, but people are people. That's not changing. If he wanted a world of angels, that's what you're talking about. Nobody going through any strife. Nobody. I mean, everything the Jews are about is taken away. And God tells us what she's doing. God, what's she doing? This is Isaiah. I am making a new heaven and a new earth. And what that says is this earth is gone when this new heaven is created. What is it? It's a, ho a new host of angels. Who are they? The Jewish people. See chapters 1 and 10 of Ezekiel. That's spiritual heaven. God, does, If God creates an angel, he creates the personality of that angel. He doesn't want it. He wants it done down here with his people who have been through hell and back again. And yet here they are still surviving. That's who he wants. That's who he wants in heaven. Why is, does, is, does his heaven stop when your messianic air gets here? Because he don't want those people. He don't want people that don't go to strife, who are persecuted, where there's no anti-Semitism, where there's no Christians hating on you. Now, now he's got a whole bevy of Christians he's got to haul up to heaven. Now, that ain't happening. It's a Jewish heaven. He tells us. I'm creating a heaven where the name Israel shall endure. There are no Gentiles in heaven today, and they never will be. Never have been. I know. They talk to their loved ones every day up there. Well, they ain't up there. They surely aren't. There's not a one of you sin free and rising because of the death of a story, mythical character called Jesus. That's all he is. And it started with the Essenes of the Dead Sea Scrolls. But what else do you get? Well, <clears throat> was made here. What does you get? Well, you get covenant friendships. It's got everything in it. No longer will you be the taunts of nations. Never again will you be defeated and dispersed again. That's pretty good starters. And God's here with a man, just like he was with Moses. Telling him to tell them, as I've been telling you, Jews for Judaism, Outreach Judaism, you've been dismissed because I'm here. I know, you don't teach that. That's not part of the Messianic era. When David gets here, all the shepherds are dismissed and God has a reckoning. What do you think a reckoning is? It's a judgment. And the judgment results in dismissal. It's not from your synagogue. It's not from your jobs. No, it's in the, you're dismissed from God. And if you think he, see, I think y'all have all forgotten how scared the Israelites were of God. Moses, you, you talk to him. You, you come tell us what he says. We're all going to die. He had them petrified. You think he... And what does he say? When I come back, if Elijah isn't heated, if he had known for who he is, other destruction is going to occur in the land. That's what that says. It's not him personally. It's not Sodom and Gomorrah. That's not part of the Messianic era. Where's your description of Elijah? None of what these people say works. This is based on writings from the town and, and 300 common era. Things when they compiled everything of stories and this and that from the antiquity, which starts in four, uh, which uh, was from the beginning of, of time to 400 common era. And then you pick up with the Middle Ages, which apparently weren't that much better. This is who has, has decided. Rambam. I think he died in 1100 or so. So the first order of my business is Moshiach is to tell you, well, I'm here, whether you want to believe it or not, but let's just say it's true. And it is. Uh, I don't see all these changes happening. And I don't see a perfect world. Not at all. We got all kinds of problems in the United States right now. Best I can tell about Pretty much ignores it all, which means I, I ignore it all. We got other things to do. Even if it's watch movies. <laughs> they let me watch movies. Um, 
Yeah, no longer the taunts of nations. Why? Because people, you're going to be saying, you're going to be telling the Christians, you're on top. Hey, Christians, we told you this is how to dis decipher 53. All those words that you use for a crucifixion which never occurs, all those words are just to train this man up, just like Ezekiel. See, you got something to point to. This is no Jesus. He's a story. It starts with the scenes. The scenes embodied. It's because they didn't write of him. You have to understand, their founder was called the teacher of righteousness. That's his very name in the Dead Sea Scroll. That's the man of Isaiah 53. God's righteous servant who makes the many righteous by his knowledge. With long life, he sees his children. That's their founder. And I think it, they say it's about 100 years before the first, uh, the first year of the common era, which would be 100 years before Jesus was born. You, you, and you do realize there's multiple stories about him. It's even in the New Testament. I never hear anybody bring it up. But uh, uh, there's one story that said Jesus partook of the blood with the children and the flesh. They're talking about eating a human being. To, for what purpose? To have power. To take that person's life, people used to think back then. Drink somebody's blood, you're either stronger, or you get their life, or you live longer, or we can save you, etc., etc. long time ago, we don't really believe that anymore. But he partook in the flesh and the blood with the children. And I guess that means kids couldn't get a job, <laughs> couldn't find anything else to eat. And you can understand these people believing these kind of things that we hear about today. Grand Band's principles are involatile. It's 13 principles. You still believe in the resurrection of the dead. You know how that comes about? It comes about with ignorance. It comes about with illiteracy. It comes about with little knowledge in the world. A person walks outside, they see the ground where their loved one was buried. You know what they think? I wish they'd come out of the ground and be alive again. Okay, we don't think that when we go out to cemeteries anymore, do we? If anything, you think their spirit's in heaven. You don't go out and stare at it and wait for them to come out of it. God tells them, don't sit in the cemeteries. <laughs> don't sit there and want them to come out. They're not coming out. They're dust. Billions of people. How many Jews? Look, you got, you got 7 million brother Jews right now. You got six million that died in the in the in the Holocaust. They're gonna come back up. You got basically six hundred thousand plus up to I've heard it as high as three million with their families, men coming back in the Exodus. And only two of all that got to go in, but uh, there's another million. Now you've just equaled the born and haven't died yet Israeli Jews. And an equivalent number of dead Jews who have come back that you now have to take care of. I guess we can send one to every house. He said, what's the problem with that? What about all the Jews in between? What about the Jews who died in Egypt? They were there 400 years. You really want to see those folks? You think you do. God tell me, if you've seen those people from back then, you know what you do? You run. You get out of there as quick as you can. I don't know exactly what it means, but it makes me laugh every time I hear it. It's got to be billions. I don't know the number. Um, all the Jews who died in Europe, all the Jews who died in the United States. And what's the other belief? The Jews outside of Israel, their spirits and souls crawl onto the ground until they pop up in Israel. How long does that take? How long do they keep popping up? It would destroy the Israeli government. I mean, at some point in time, you got to say, okay, God said this. It looks like prophecy. Sounds like prophecy. It is prophecy, but that can't happen. No, that's not what y'all did. That's not what the people in 300 did and the town of them before. That's not what they did. They started making stuff up. They said, yeah, we're going to have a world that's perfect. Everybody loves everybody, but God will tell you, you can't. That's not perfect. It won't work. It won't work. No competition? I mean, you can't be friends with your comp competitor, at least not while you're competing. You can't, it just simply won't work. You've got to have anger. 
You get, you got to have people who want to drive themselves because the others call them names. Why do you think that Jesus is so successful? Because they've been beat down and people talk bad about them. They say, oh yeah, well, I'm going to Harvard. <laughs> I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm going to make some noise. This Jew's going to kick some butt. That's what you get. That's what God wants. See, that's perfect for God. That's the guy he wants in heaven. He didn't want the people you're talking about, Mr. Singer. He's not changing his world because of something written by people three hundred in the year 300 come there or compiled 300. And I think that's the right number. But let's get back to judgment. Oh, well, let me think. What, what else we got? What is, never defeated again. Not the taunts of nations. God says uh, he's going to do a planting of renown, which he's already started. It's why the land blooms again in Jeremiah. See, he knew about his covenant and friendship, even though Ezekiel comes after Jeremiah. But uh, that's where you find the covenant of friendship, chapters 34 and 37. 37 is, I'm going to put, bring my temple back again. So again, he knows Rome's about to destroy it, disperse them, and that's who Jeremiah is writing for. See, a time is coming. The Roman dispersal is going to come back. And here's the kid. Here, this is a beautiful one. Toby Singer says God <clears throat> performs human sacrifice of the six million Jews in the Holocaust. Yes, he does. It's a shocker to me. He went Christian. You know, they kill. They have God sacrificing one son. Toby Singer has God sacrificing six million. And I still can't. And Toby Singer, God, God's purpose which might prosper. <laughs> From, from 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 murdering in, in as heinous and, and, and cruel way that you can possibly imagine six million of the Jews. So that they, his purpose being that they go back to to Israel. Now didn't he prophesy that there was going to be an end gathering? Didn't he prophesy that? Did, did he say he was going to kill six million Jews to make them do it? Did he say he was going to make his prophecy happen? Or was he just saying they're going to come back? They will, and the world's going to drive them back. <laughs> you know, the exiles came back. Cyrus led them. They said, well, not, and as I understand it, not everybody came back from Babylon. They liked where they were living, just like I'm sure there's going to be American Jews who never want to go back to Israel, particular secular ones, particular atheists. Uh, there's never going to be every Jew back in. But I'll tell you one thing. If my presence does anything, when the Jews start holding me up high and announcing to Christianity, here's how you interpret 53, and guess what? That's him. And now he's not going to walk on water for you. As you watch this, we're going to have a temple built. You don't know the importance of that. You, I don't know if everybody knows that Islam sits on top of it, and they call it their third most holy site. The Rock of the Dome. We talk about it all the time. I tell the guy, I said, you've got to let me get a camera crew and go up there and throw a stick of dynamite on me. Moshe takes down the golden dome. Get your Islam out of God's temple now. I ask him, what? why in the hell, after the Six-Day War, did they give it over to Jordan? There was that. He said, yeah, they thought they had to. And they needed to. Uh, he won't tell me, is what he's saying. I don't have to study up on that one. Now, we take it again, and you're not giving the Temple Mount back to them. And Palestinians, they're just Jordanians. There's never been a, a, a state, a country, a Palestinia. You know, except what Rome called it. Who cares what Rome called it? I don't care. Sure, for a time it was called Philistine, Philistine. Uh, it's a name they got off a of mountain outside of Rome. I mean, do you really keep the occupiers' name? Do, do, are, are they Romans? These Philistines? If they are, there's another. Let's kick them over to Italy. He said, there's too many of them now. No, there's not. God doesn't think so. You know what God would do, right? I mean, just to remind y'all who he is. You know what he'd tell you to do? If, we, if he could get away with it in this day of satellites and social media, and newscasters, he said, just drive me to the sea. It don't bother me. <laughs> oh, God. 
who cares? Throw away the in there and their kids and their animals and throw all this stuff in there too. Get them off my land. He calls them the trespassers. I said, what about those who, who by now would have staked the claim under adverse possession? And he said, Mr. Keith, you can't adversely possess my land like you can in Texas. I said, okay. I guess not. I don't know if anybody's going to believe that, but it makes sense. Okay, it makes a lot of sense. Let's carry on. Oh, oh. Well, anyway, his purpose is to, be, is to return to his temple suddenly. Okay, it doesn't have anything to do with four. <laughs> I gotta get back to the. Here's the kicker on that. Now, who. Now, he's saying Israel's the righteous ser servant, but they all died. He uses them, I guess, for this idea that their appearance was marred and this and that. But then they're supposed to come and startle nations and silence kings by showing them what they had never heard, see what they had never behold, or something like that. Well, you know, think about those words when you're listening to me and you're saying he can't be him, he's not Jewish. I've already told you. That's the beauty of it. Tell the Christians. He's a Gentile. He comes from a Christian country and no Jews with him. And we wouldn't know God was coming if he didn't have a human being with him. And God says, What's he, what am I going to do? Come back and uh, bring my Moshiach as an Ortho Orthodox? Is he going to be the Rebbe, the Lebevich? Is it somebody who just studies Torah? He didn't even let me look at the town unless we need a piece of it. I mean, I know all about it. I know how it's put together and everything. He has me read the complete history of the Jewish people. We talk about it. But, um, so the murder, who did they make, what's the many, the murder of the Holocaust made righteous? I mean, it's such a simple question. Who got long life? And who did the sacrifice? I mean, did they sacrifice themselves? That's like you sitting up at the altar of the first, of the second temple and uh, lambs just started coming up and jumping into the altar what if, to, to force other lambs to join them or something. I, I had no idea what he's talking about. And, and then, out of nowhere, he says, he says these altars, they're sacrificed on the altars, these ovens of God and Auschwitz and all the other places. And, and, and in the guilt offering, you get to keep the hide of the animal that you offered up for theft, destruction of all these stuff and debts. I mean, he's got about as much to do with making people righteous as the man in the money. At least the, at least the Christians change the wording and put sin in there. It is guilt for sinning, but it's an emotion. It's the emotion of guilt. What does the righteous servant do? He goes and teaches those people and says, Look, God is here. Come back to synagogue. Remember the metaphor? New covenant? You're all forgiven. Now, get busy and show them your respect. And come on back. Get back to it. If you haven't been to it, come. It's real. God is real. You see how it all falls together? Why else is he made righteous? Who's the many? Apparently, y'all, what? Is it the kings that witness this? Kings of the witness. They're the silence and the startle. They're going to come witness to the righteous servant. But they'd be the Gentiles, so, uh, yeah, I'm not feeling I'm not feeling that either. Talk about shunning and despise. Which, of course, just makes me laugh. Because huh? I know who's with me. I know how things end up. We end up on top, us three. Me, God, and God's angel, the Holy Spirit. Yeah, we're going to end up on top. They, they can keep the door and shut me as long as they want. As God says, they should go get the people. They don't like this more. So nobody knows they get dismissed. <laughs> they don't teach that. Talk about selective. I tell you, to me, an atheist for 50 years before God spoke to me, and uh, still with no religious affiliation, synagogue, uh, and never before synagogue or church. Never been to any seminary, no, uh, no, no training, no yeshiva. Everything I know came directly from God. You know, in the Hebrew Bible. Well, and, and the Holy Bible. Matter of fact, he had me studying on Jesus first. Um, <laughs> he said it was the perfect way to do it, too, by the way. You know why? Because God did it. I got a question he didn't speak to him. 
You'll know by the words that are being used, but if you don't believe me, then it doesn't mean anything. But let me keep on going on my knowledge of Elijah. I can also tell you how he created the angel of his presence and how I know that that angel, it's his body, is the Spirit of God. That's why he's an angel of his presence and the Holy Spirit. His body, that's, that's, that's where his mind is. It's inside the Spirit of God. As though he, <laughs> he's just a whole funny. Okay. He's so funny. God. You have to understand, if there's anything I know about the emotions of God, we're all beings with emotions. Okay? But, you know, he's been around forever and pushing people in the sea, this and that. that doesn't bother him. It's nothing. It, it's, a, it's a blip. It's not even a bump. I mean, you know, I mean, it's true of even the Holocaust. You know what he said? Well, you know, I gave him some land. He just stayed in it. Well, Rome, Rome fell in five to seven hundred. Come back. He didn't come back. Instead, they wouldn't let crusaders come through and murder them out there. And then God said, I don't know they figured it out. One day they're going to come back. He doesn't have to do it as the point, Mr. Singer. You think he likes the idea that he's fulfilling his prophecies in his power? You need to see some other videos on that. Stirring the spirit of armies. Go, go, go read that. You, you need to look at all 35 uh, tapes. Those are all from the book he dictated for me. That's what I'm reading from. I'm reading from my own book that he dictated. These are his words. This is like Torah right here. There's new things to learn. You, know, you don't know how God spoke through, the burning, through an angel in the burning bush. You don't know why there's an angel of the Lord in the burning bush and God speaks. You don't know why a man wrestles with Jacob and God speaks and renames him. Israel. No, you just change it. Jacob says, I wrestled a man in divine beings. No. Jesus said, you wrestled an angel. And Jacob said, no, there is a man. I'm, I'm quite certain that they didn't like him at all. <laughs> That's all that was. God went to saw a guy near Jacob, went to him and said, wake up. I got something for you to do. And he said, okay. <laughs> That's what you do when God talks to you. You just say, okay. Because he can control everything, your perceptions, your eyes, your ears, your emotions. You don't get, you know, you don't just flop to the ground. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an amazing thing. I'm glad I've experienced it. My judgments and decisions are not based on what my eyes, oh, or is Hitler the righteous servant? But he didn't make the many righteous with long life either. As a matter of fact, nobody gets long life in that thing. And why doesn't he state his purpose? The purpose is to fulfill my own prophecies. In a perfect world, God says the world you're talking about is not perfect. The, per the world he created is perfect. He wants me to tell you that, Mr. Toby is Singer. Now, he doesn't keep everybody within his sights. He can. You know, he, he says, I know what everybody's done. I don't have to keep track of anybody. I know who's going to be into the scroll of remembrance for this heaven. That's another thing y'all don't know about. You think you're going to see David in heaven the way you're not? Generations have been given their own kind of heaven that fit them. One where there was maybe a resurrection. <laughs> Stuff like that. The people from antiquity. The people of the Holocaust may get their own heaven. Because that happened before I was born. Before I was selected. But I'm not, he, he's always kind of won't really answer me on it, but he gives me the idea that they're going to have their own heaven, but uh, it, it, it could be since the age of enlightenment. It could even go back that far. I don't think it's going to be Middle Ages and antiquity. But I do know this heaven, this, this particular heaven for the people who make it to that scroll of remembrance is incredible. It's taken me there too many times. I've been to the very room I will inhabit as a new creature, but still as myself, Keith. Just like I'm still myself now. And yet, he provides the information of my mind. Now, it's the information of my mind. But he can change it up whenever he wants. And I'm going I'm to... This one I'm going to be going over here right now. To try to get a handle on this. My judgments and decisions are not based on what my eyes and ears perceive. God not only controls my eyes and ears, he controls my... <laughs> I thought I could keep talking and he wouldn't. He wants me to tell you the Holy Spirit. 
the uh, the the thing about Hitler, why, why are you saying Hitler? Well, somebody's got to offer the sacrifice, like I said to you. I don't think anybody volunteered to be executed in the Holocaust. I don't think Jews did that. I think they tried to stay away from him the best they could. So they didn't offer themselves. That means Hitler is the one who offered. And, surprise, surprise, to back up his ridiculous argument and be an impediment to me, who is the man described, as they said, the leper scholar, the man of suffering familiar with the disease in the town. And some things in the town that aren't, aren't sacked the same, uh, aren't, you know, you have to go with it. And also, everybody's got a different opinion, even in the town. You still got to pick on who you believe in or what, if you like what they had to say. But, but in Isaiah 53, the righteous servant, as his portion, receives the many. Look at his people. He makes many righteous, many. And as his spoil the multitude, which means the many, you know, I'm starting small, but one day it'll be a multitude, which can be any number of people. I have no way of knowing. You know, at that point, I just go, well, this is God's thing. I mean, he knows. I'm not going to worry about it. He won't tell me. You'd be surprised how he does tell me that I can be assured of anyway. Uh, but he says... He says, in this guilt offering, you get to keep the hide if you're the offerer. And Hitler, he says, kept the hides of Jews and made lamps out of them. That as his portion. So I think Toby Singer believes Hitler was God's righteous servant. But that breaks the question, because that means he's David. Now, he may disagree with that, but that's what the Talmud says. And there's a hookup between chapter 11 and uh, Isaiah 53 in no less than four verses. I've gone through, I think, just earlier today. Maybe yesterday. <laughs> we put all 35 or 37 of these videos together in less than 30, or in 30 days. Uh, but anyway, it's going to over a year and a half to read the book. And I've got just about it. We've, we flipped through it. What else can we talk about? Let's see if there's anything left. And pretty much down to decision and judgments. And this comes from the second book the life of God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53. Well, that's my life. And God dictated that too. Uh, he says he's got a little bit more he's going to get out of it. But that comes from uh, the life of the right. This does that I'm reading. God not only controls my eyes and ears, he controls my perceptions formed from what he has me see and hear. And he determines all my decisions and judgments, great and small. God has shown me many times that he can have me see things that are not there. <laughs> the Holy Spirit gets involved with it. It gets spooky sometimes. It just does. Sometimes, sometimes I just shake my head. I said, what goes on in y'all's minds? It's scary. He can have me hear things when there are no sound waves in my environment. Of what I'm hearing, in other words, I hear a car wreck behind me, but there's no car wreck. Turn around, start on thinking about to get hit by some rolling cars, and there's nothing there. He's just showing me the kind of control he has. For example, God can have me see a per he can literally have me see a person who's not there. And he can see me, have me see a different person from the person that is there. <laughs> These are things I've been learning for 13 years, by the way. Okay, there's a... He tells me that it's just his control of my mind that he does these things, bypassing what my ears and eyes would normally perceive. It's like he puts a vision into it. It's how you create a vision. You know? I mean, that's how God sees. It's his mind. It's his will. He, in other words, he doesn't have eyes, but he takes his absolute knowledge of everything from molecules. And just everything. Absolute knowledge. And he, for instance, he, he has absolute knowledge of this room. Everything in it. Okay? And he basically creates a vision of it. Primarily for the Holy Spirit, the angel of his presence, but for him. He says, we see better than uh, HCTV, Keith. Time to make it real for me. 
That's Isaiah. That's the eyes of God. It's, it's, his eyes are his absolute knowledge and ability in, in his incredible imagination. The imagination that came up with this world, by the way, that is perfect. For my purposes, he would say, can, can I go on? And to teach me how absolute that control is. I call this partial mind perception visions while wide awake. There's also visuals. They just send pictures to me, to me all the time. I mean, we'll be talking about Burger King, and i got a picture of Burger King coming back to my heart. <laughs> Anything. I mean, it started out with, with silly things like, like I'm coming, I'm coming to a, a cross-section in the street, and there's a stop sign comes in front of my eye, in my mind. A picture of a stop sign. Stop. Stop. But he's controlling the walk anyway. But anyway. Here's an extreme example of something that happened recently. And it really surprised me. And I don't surprise easily anymore. One night I was walking by my flat screen television on a chair at the end of the bed, and God shut me. An invisible hand just shoved me. It wasn't hard, it didn't hit me. He just shoved me. Into <laughs> to, it was my left shoulder. And it's not the first time. He's pushed me a lot like that when we're out walking. He always makes me laugh. It's just like your friend doing that to you. You know, you cut nothing laughing. This time, he pushed me into the flat screen TV. And unbeknownst to me, there's a little bitty antenna on the back of that TV that you have to have to pick up Wi-Fi for the TV to even work. I mean, it's a little bitty thing. And he hit me with just enough force for the TV to come off the chair it was on and land precisely on that little piece and snap it up. Broke my TV. Didn't have TV for a week. <laughs> it's, yeah. I have not, that's the only thing I got. <clears throat> this time he broke off the, mind you, he's dictating this, but this time he broke off the little antenna on the back and ruined the television. The repairman said it could not be fixed. Now I am in self-quarantine. As I thought this, coronavirus is, is in the news. And uh, do not have television. I use YouTube on my cell phone for two weeks watching movies, waiting on my monthly Social Security money I began receiving last month, 90% of which I give my parents for taking care of me for 10 years with their Social Security money. God said... I'm going to have you purchase a new television with a large screen in HD that connects to the internet to be used as a backdrop for YouTube videos on the two books. This is all news to me. There it is right here. <laughs> Just see what I went through to get this thing here. That's all another story. Everything's an event for me because I'm in the fire of a Let's just say it wasn't comfortable. Say the least. I had, uh, more interesting, bringing the, the, the Holy Spirit on this, I had set the old television, this is before I got to know it, and, and that's why I got to see, I didn't know we were really going to be doing YouTube, he tells me stuff like that just to irritate me sometimes, hey, we're going to get a brand new car, and I'm like, what, and I go, you're not getting me a car, he said, just trying to draw motion from me, because apparently when I get to Madlet, in Gagarian uh, Airport, I'm out of the fire of refinement, fine. You know, for the most part. The Holy Spirit says there'll always be some tune ups. But uh see he can he can make me emotionless. I mean I can go through here every day with it with nothing bothering me. Just like I'm in heaven. You see, I'm really I say, you know, that's great, you know, you control my mind and supply the information that I'm in heaven. You can make me emotionless. I've seen him do it too many times. And I know all about it. It's been a long teaching, but I'm very familiar with it. And so I don't have emotions as you want in heaven. You know, it's pretty much a, almost a joyous state, kind of like right underneath that. But nothing is bothering you. And he says, that's how you're going to be. So what I'm doing is I'm drawing all those bad emotions out of you during this 13 years. 
I said, I don't think I'd have felt all these things that all these emotions might have to be 120. I said, you're just making up emotions and stuff. He said, well, you, you know, it's my power. Nobody else gets this. It's kind of like a payment almost. If I'm going to do this through you, you know, I, I'm, going, I'm going to get you as close to being humble and meek as I can in my power. He said, only so far I can take you. Anyway, so that's why, that, that's part of this uh, wounding, punishment, chastisement, maltreatment, brushing and cruising. It's just to bring emotion, anything, embarrassment. It put me in situation, they just embarrass the fire out of me and then say, look, watch. Uh, embarrassment's gone. <laughs> it's just gone. Feels like a pillow comes over my chest. Apparently that's where all, all my emotions are located in my chest or something. But... Uh, so anyway, I set the broken television up against the wall. <clears throat> broken and, and unplugged. The Holy Spirit, whose presence is almost always to my left, in the videos, he's always up and to my right. <clears throat> Four wall from the bed. Broken and unplugged. The Holy Spirit, whose presence is almost always to my left, as I sat in bed, said, I am going to show you something that I can do in God's power. That, that God supplies the power for. He doesn't have power. It's, he says, it takes a lot of concentration, so do not bother me. And I said, okay. That's what you say to both of them, okay. So you have to understand, you got, his voice sounds like a five-year-old. That's how he talks to them. I mean, he doesn't talk like a five-year-old, he just sounds like one. Okay, suddenly I realized I'm watching a movie on a broken, unplugged television. I mean, I'm literally watching television. <laughs> it looks just like television. It's like the TV fixed itself and plugged itself in. The spirit, but then the Spirit is putting it together scene by scene, and God is putting it into my mind. A vision of a movie on a broken television while I am wide awake. The movie looked like it was filmed in the 1920s. It was an action movie. In one scene, a lion attacked a deer. And the deer was knocked forward a few feet, stopped, lifted its head, turned, and went after the lion. That's when I knew for sure he was putting it together. Because it was just too funny. It was hilarious. And he went after the lion who ran away with the deer chasing him. <clears throat> I cannot explain the movie. It had Indians and bows and arrows, high priests, blood rituals, kings with scepters, aliens, alien machinery, Africa, wild animals, without even a hint of a plot or any story coherence. But it was fun to watch. Yeah, the mind of the Holy Spirit is something to behold. Except, just like me, God controls the information of His mind. Because He's an angel. He does that with all of them. And like I said, you know, I'm experienced with Him be like, so I can teach it. That's why He takes Elijah to heaven and sends him back. Because He says the Jews don't have enough of a spiritual heaven taught to them. Everything's about this, this Messianic era, and then after the Messianic era, the world to come. Which is in one of my videos that I got from articles from a uh, Jewish uh, website. Jewish learning or something. No, I don't think it was in. But, um, I do understand how God will become the information knowledge of the angels Israel, though. And I just went through that. Okay, this, this information comes from Wikipedia. Because that surprised me. I didn't know this. Uh, that, that my thoughts, you know, coming from a brain that always was peculiar to me. He says, no, actually, your spirit interprets the little electro, uh, the things I'm about to read on electrodes and, and synapses and this and that of the brain. Your spirit actually takes that information, understands what it is, and that's your person. That's who you are. 
your thoughts are really coming as your spirit, which you will have in heaven. All God's got to do is give you a source of what your eyes and your ears and your memory bring to you. And he limits it to, to all things Jewish. It's a Jewish heaven across the board. And that's another pull for Elijah. Come back to synagogue. Because you're going to love heaven if you really get busy. The more you know, the greater your experience. There's meeting places. You could be talking about all this. But uh, again, uh, God had me go. He said, go, go look. Go, uh, Google brain uh, Wikipedia. Okay, so copy all that. Paste it on your notebook. That's how these things get written. You know, I don't get a parchment <laughs> and a writing material. Anyway, uh, here's some excerpts. Visually, the interior of the brain consists of areas so-called gray matter with a dark color separated by areas of white matter with a lighter color. The functions of the brain depend on the ability of neurons to transmit electrical signals electrochemical signals to other cells and their ability to respond appropriately to electrochemical signals received from other cells. The electrical properties of neurons are controlled by a wide variety of biochemical and metabolic processes, most notably the interactions between neurotransmitters and receptors that take place at synapses. Okay, there's a lot more. Everybody can get your interest and go read about it. 